Our following guest is a producer, solo artist, and live tour musician. He has a synthwave project called All the Damn Vampires. I've been jamming those tunes all week and I love them, so they're definitely worth checking out. He's been on tour with Winds of Plague, and in the past few years, he's been the live touring keyboard player for Korn, which is sick. <laughs> he offered a lot of insight how you get gigs like that, which I learned a lot from, so I hope you do too. Let's get into it. Please welcome Davey Oberlin. vaccine and how i'm dying but that's cool all the fun stuff that's cool yeah so this is gonna be my last podcast so here. I'm, <laughs> I'm happy that you're that you're part of it yeah, yeah. I, I'm, it's, I'm part of the legacy now <laughs> <laughs> dude totally i i was listening to your synthwave project on monday and there's this one song that made me start crying i was in this room listening to it uh pacific coast heartbreak Oh, dude, that's it, my dude. That's my fucking jam, dude. Instrumental or vocal? Vocals. First? Okay, yeah, yeah, dude. I, I'm glad that that translated to you in that sense because, like, I was. I think I was driving from Laguna back to uh, Northern Orange County on Pacific Coast Highway. Yeah, and uh, I just had this melody going in my head, and I was like. I already like picked out the title. I'm like, like it's kind of cheesy, but it's cool. Pacific Coast Heartbreak. All right, sat down, composed it, and then I got together with Mint. Um, well, they were in town to do my Saturday music video, and yeah. we sat down, and I was just like, okay, like here's some lines that I'm thinking, and I had all these lyrics written out, and we went back and forth and and just tracked it, you know. Um, well, and her. Uh, their voice is so cool because it like perfectly like fits that vibe, you know. It the, does. Yeah. So yeah, it's a cool track. I, I still listen to it all the time. So I appreciate you you checking it out too. Yeah, it's yeah. great. I don't think it's a cheesy title. I think it's very fitting because um you might think it's cheesy, but when someone reads that, like let's say like I read it, like I don't I think like, oh wow, Pacific Coast, that that could mean anything. To me, yeah. I was like, Oh, California. I'm from California, so then it kind of spoke to me in that in that way. Yeah, you know, yeah, it's crazy. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, we 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 really get to experience like just the world in a different way here. I think you know, like I'm sure yeah. you've you've been all over, and uh, every state and every country has its own thing. You know, that's cool. But like we really have those like coastal drives and yeah. uh, that kind of beach lifestyle, and it just it has a different type of nostalgia that hits you. You know, like it does. Yeah, something about it. And and driving that coast was always, like, therapeutic for me, you know, like, um, whether it was, like, you know, we we're going to play a show at, like, Chain Reaction or something back in the day, and yeah. I, was, I was nervous, and it was going to be a big night, drive that coast and just kind of wind down, you know, maybe go grab some food and just kind of prepare myself. But it, there's there's something so therapeutic about that, like that ocean sunset, the moon over it, you know, yeah. that, that ocean air. Um, it, it just has so many different... Uh, like emotions that it evokes so that that song in particular was really derived from just like in in honoring of that you know particular drive <laughs> yeah and it's it's interesting that you have the word heartbreak in there where to yeah. me it's actually the opposite effect happened to me where i i had a opposite uh connection to it it made me think about love yeah okay. in, like a, in a positive way yeah you know it's like oh yeah. but uh, I, the word heartbreak's in it because it's probably like a sad song, correct? Yeah, okay, yeah. but to me, it actually, which is to me like why I'm so attached to that song. That's a great song where you have two. It, it can evoke any feeling, yeah. You know, and for me, it was it's a very positive. I was like, wow, like, wow, being it made me think about being in love and how like you know lucky I am. And I was like, I was like, damn, that's that's that that's deep. But then after the song was over. I could understand like that's not what they mean but sure but, but for me it hit me in a completely different way and that and that's a great song yeah that's you know? perfect actually i i think that um you know the way that that song sounds and the the subject matter it's all like how you're looking at it too you know because yeah like i've i've had a lot of uh you know crazy relationship ups and downs and um you know it, when you're in love it's also kind of like 
a risk too. You know, you're like, you're, you're, you're putting yourself out there for someone else to potentially let you down. So I think there's like that drama hanging in the air. So like, even if it's a little bit sad, but a little bit uplifting at the same time, it, it's kind of, it works, you know, because like you said, like you can feel the love in that. And then I can, I can feel the heartbreak, but they're not, yeah. um, you know, they both exist in the same world. So it definitely, uh, is cool that that vibe kind of transcends. Yeah, it's a very transcendent vibe. Yeah, you know, absolutely. It's it's so. Uh, yeah, being in love is scary, man. <laughs> yeah, dude. Yeah, too. Like, yeah, it took me, like, you know, a month over, like maybe a, a couple of years, and yeah, trying to make yourself open yeah. to like because you're like like you said, like you you open yourself up to like to heartbreak. Yeah, you know, and that's like, that's the scariest part, but that's what you have to do to fully fall in love. Yeah, you have to open yourself up, be vulnerable that heartbreak yeah it's terrifying man you're sitting down at the blackjack table you're like i'm gonna sit down the house always wins but i want to see the cards you know and and take that chance so it's uh yeah it i mean nobody's uh immune to it like you you're all you know at that risk so it's uh it's something that transcends like you know every single genre and walk of life is like the pursuit of love and relationships you know yeah I think it's always a hot topic that everyone can relate to. So totally. heartbreak, I feel like for me, or sad songs was always the most relatable thing. Like, um, I think everybody can say they've gone through something. Not everybody can say they've been extremely happy or truly happy, but everybody yeah. can say they've felt anxious or heartbroken about something, you know? Like, yeah. did you ever used to listen to, like, Placebo? You ever hear, like, you know, Portishead, like, bands like that? Like Portishead, so yeah. good. Like, they all, like, you know... The songs that that I would go to and listen to were like the sadder songs, like you know, and same. And that actually made me feel better because somebody else was relating to it. You know, it was like, oh, cool, like they get it. You know, <laughs> like yeah. like this is a, a rough time in my life, but this song like is relatable. So I think it's important to have that. Yeah, it's very cool how you could kind of make like a very horrible situation into like a positive and then other people could like listen to like your heartbreak and like, be like oh this is cool yeah yeah <laughs> yeah it's important man like yeah it, there's there's no tough guy that's gonna you know get away from it like everybody no matter who they are how tough they are they're gonna go through something man like love is like the great equalizer it is you, know, you think of the story of like samson you know i, I always uh, growing up in the church, like I always would reference that in my head. I'm like, man, there's always going to be like an Achilles heel, you know, that you're going to run into. So, yeah, um, I'm cool with it. I, I think it's exciting. <laughs> Makes yeah. me write music, you know. Yeah, it's great. Love heartbreak is very universal. And something that I learned recently this past week, which is from you, uh, I was listening to a, a, a uh, interview you you did. And you said the keyboard is universal. And it made me think like, that is true. A lot of a lot of songs have keyboard or synth in it more than maybe like guitar. Yeah. And it made me think about that instrument in a whole new light. And it, was, yeah. it made me like want to like get like a keyboard. Yeah. It was like it is. It's a very universal sound and feeling. Mm -hmm. You know. And you uh, you taught me that. It's cool. Oh, dude, cool. I, I I'm glad like. Sometimes I'll just speak without a filter, you know, and like yeah. if it's profound and it, it makes sense, that's awesome. And I think that, that that's a really good, uh, you know, kind of element of, of uh, musical atmosphere to hang on to. Like the keyboard comes in and if you don't even notice it, like then it, it might have done its job, you know, like I didn't even know that Corn uh, had live keyboard before I started playing with them live. And uh, wow when I found out what it was and I listened to things isolated, whatever Zach, uh, before me was doing, it was so cool. Cause it totally made sense. It was like, it's just that extra layer. A lot of bands will go and they'll do tracks, you know, and they'll put a lot of tracks and there's nothing wrong with that. I think it's awesome. You know, if you're playing to a click and you can do tracks, you can really build a nice sonic element in your live show. But with corn, mm -hmm. they didn't, they don't want to play to tracks, you know, they want to do it as pure as possible and be able to improvise on the fly. And, that's part of the magic with the Corn Live show. And uh, so you've got those like Moog synth uh, synthesizers in the background and certain things that are happening yeah. live. And it's it's more than just like people think keyboards, they think piano and keys and you're, you're playing yeah. all this piano theory, but it's like, no, not at all. Like you're just providing these 
these uh, layers and these pads. And, you know, I would argue even the, the keyboard in Korn Live is more like a guitar, you know. So it's, sometimes really? it's following the the guitarist sometimes it's following uh the bass lines or holding down bass lines so that feely can slap or you know like there's just all kinds of cool nuances to it that i didn't appreciate before uh i was put in that position so it was really interesting it, it opened up my mind a lot you know i was scared thinking like okay i'm a guitar player i've always played guitar live like what do i even do when i'm like you know sitting behind this keyboard but yeah, yeah once i heard those isolated tracks like it all made sense you know and then i just kind of developed my own take on it and and things of that nature but um it lends itself so well to so many things like i can't imagine how many tracks yeah. how many songs that we've personally liked or that have uh done well or, you know on the radio or whatever that if you were to take away the the keyboards or some of those like pads like what would it even sound like you oh know, like, yeah very thin like very thin you're right yeah y'all take away the emotion of it yeah right? yeah exactly like that you said it right there the emotion like you can hide emotion and make people feel a certain way um by just tucking something light in the background you know like totally we watch uh horror films and you don't even notice but they've added those little stingers and those little like little sounds that are just slowly creeping up in the background and making you feel that tension otherwise like yeah. you know she's gonna walk across the room and michael myers is gonna jump out and without that musical cue and those sound cues it's yeah n nobody's gonna be affected by it maybe two or three people but um it's subtle and i think subtlety is is underrated like you know because the, the whole point is not to point it out it's just there to yeah. kind of guide you emotionally and subconsciously totally I, you said the right word i was i was wait i was waiting to i say it's like uh those subconscious sounds yeah in the background but yeah. but they're there and like and and they tap into your subconscious like they kind of invoke a feeling without maybe even you knowing that it invoked a feeling yeah you know yeah it's important it's uh, super important it's utilized more than than we imagine you know and like yeah um it, when you point it out it makes it might make a lot of people go back and want to rewatch or re-listen to things and try to pick that out because that's what it did yeah. for me you know when i realized what was going on i've always been a, a big fan of um motion picture scores and uh you know even just like musicals or classical pieces and just picking yeah. out all the like layers and everything and understanding that it took me a, a long time to really understand it you know but uh learning to appreciate like hans zimmer and john williams and guys like that you know you, you're like i can apply this to metal or i can apply this to synthwave you know it's like great i've been doing these uh remixes for sumerian records uh, most recently, Black Veil Brides, Scarlet Cross, I did a remix for it. And cool. I was like, I've got all these cool like sound libraries with like trailer sounds and risers and sweeps. And I was like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw some of that in, you know, just to kind of build up the parts and make it a little more cinematic. And hmm. it's cool. They totally, you know, work together in those worlds. Like, and it just adds an extra element. Um, I've even heard some, you know, some bands doing breakdowns where they have door slams on the, you know, the start <laughs> of the breakdown. Like yeah. that's like a, a classic trailer sound, you know, that door slam. It's yeah, like, it's true. Yeah, so it's really cool. Yeah, it's cool. I love when the uh, when the artist or a band would throw in like you know random sounds. Yeah, it cool. It adds like a yeah like a cinematic, like vibe to it. Yeah, absolutely. It's cool. It doesn't have to be literal, you know. You can just have fun with it, and you can you can get crazy. And I think that's the the funnest part about music production, you know. Like, yeah, I get a lot of uh, people wondering why I'm not doing like dark darker stuff or heavier stuff because of what I've been involved in. But I'm like, you know, those we're, we'd literally be taking the same paint palette and you know putting it putting the pieces together with that. It's it's all relative, and it's like. You know, you can just go crazy with it. I do like the the darker stuff sometimes because there's less limitations. It's it's a little bit harder for me to write happier, like more poppy stuff. But yeah, it's like I I grew up like around all this stuff, so it's easy to just reach in and go, okay, here's something dark and, and heavier. You know? Yeah, it's like you uh, like to me, like you come off as like a a '80s guy. <laughs> yeah. Like, 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 yeah, like, yeah, I mean, yeah, you, I mean, your last voice. I mean, yeah, it's my favorite movie ever. Yeah, I think I, I would, I would say that's, uh, that's fair because I, uh, I grew up with three awesome sisters, but my oldest sister, she was like the quintessential '80s teen, and so yeah. I had the, you know, I kind of grew up watching what her and her friends were doing and what they were into and, and overhearing the music, and um, it just that era just makes me happy you know it reminds me of a lot of good memories and i think you know 
the the films and the things that were going on were much more interesting. Like we're at a yeah. point right now, like if you watch these Marvel films, the entire world is always just exploding or falling apart and it's yeah, these massive s- scale CGI. And I think we're like kind of desensitized, you know, but then mm-hmm. it, if you go back and you watch like Nightmare on Elm Street, the first time you see that, you can't believe it's real. You know, the makeup's so incredible and the the scenarios, yeah. you know, but now it's just like, oh yeah, I've seen the Eiffel Tower get knocked down by a, you know, <laughs> s- a spaceship like six yeah. times. <laughs> so it, don't, it doesn't register the same, you know, there was an excitement back then that, um, I'm just, I'm totally aging myself, but yeah, there was just an excitement, you know, like computer games were, were new and exciting. People were yeah. still going to the mall that you had the, you had the technology and the uh, the kind of futuristic sense sensibilities, but you still had to go and it still had to be tangible. You know, you still had to experience that with other people. So yeah, that's, we don't really have that as much anymore. You know, we've got like Amazon now, and you know, the mall experience is totally different. It is different. Man, going to mall and going to a toy store was so sick. <laughs> yes, dude, miss it. It really was. K- KB Toys. Toys KB Us. Toys. That was the one I went to. <laughs> Holy fuck. Dude, KB got a bad rap, man. I felt like like Toys R Us was crushing them. But I'd go to KB and I'd be like, oh, they got some G.I. Joes I haven't seen over at Toys yeah. R Us. <laughs> you know? Some like cooler helmets on these ones, you know. Yeah, yeah. I'd always been to KB Toys and bought whatever movie was out. I happened to have toys out and they, they would yep. just have them. Dude, I, I would still like... If I could, I would still play with action figures. <laughs> like, yeah. I was like obsessed when I was a kid. I remember my my dad would uh, he would have like this crazy long shift at work, and then I would wait for him in our outside patio area to get off work. And as he would walk in, he would always have a bag from Toys R Us, and he'd have an action figure in it for me. So it'd be like Ghostbusters or oh, Ninja dude. Turtles. And I, I mean, to this day, I still have that excited feeling, you know, thinking about that because it was so cool, man. Like these little works of art, you know, and like, I see, yeah. I, I follow some Instagram pages that have like action figures. I have friends that make vinyl figures and figures. And, yeah. um, so I, I look at them and I'm like, dude, this is so cool. Like, it's just, it's still really, um, interesting and exciting to me. I have, I have, I have like a yeah. lot of figures and stuff in cases, like a lot of video game stuff. And yeah. I'm a huge nerd, you know, so I've got, I've got all my Nintendo Amiibos still in their boxes and, you know, I, yeah. I love collecting that sort of stuff. Yeah, it's cool when like those those figures, especially from that minor book, of feeling from back in the day, are, like it's crazy how how they have that like thing to them. Yeah, you know. Yeah, it's absolutely. crazy. There's a there's a, a a place in speaking of of the mall that has like you know eighties fig- figurines. They have like these massive uh, uh, Ninja Turtle uh, from like the first original movie. They're, oh, they're, they're, yeah. they're like they're like this fucking big, and I see them like I want I want to buy them. Yeah. It is. It just makes me. It just make, it makes you feel good. I don't know what it is. Yeah, it's crazy. Yeah. It's. I don't know. It's like these little totems or idols to like these cool, yeah. cool films and figures. But like those costumes were so rad. There, there's a company. I think they're called NECA. Um, I could be wrong, but they do like limited runs of these really high quality releases. And they would go to like Comic Con, and they did uh, a small run of the Ninja Turtles. Uh, I think it was the first film, the actual costume, the figurines wow. down to the, the f- smallest detail. They're super accurate, super posable. Wow. And uh, yeah, you could go to the convention and I think it was like a hundred bucks and you got all, all of the Ninja Turtles with a little set piece and it came in a VHS box. And, uh, you know, if you didn't get it there, like eBay is crazy. Like they're scalping him, you know? So, wow. yeah, I had a buddy that was at Comic-Con. I'm like, dude, I'll pay you whatever. Just make sure I get those Ninja Turtles figures. Because I that movie, the costumes were my favorite. I loved that. You really? Know, I feel like it still holds up to this day. You know, if you watch the Turtles films, it's kind of like, wow, that's incredible. You know, like just the fact that they're acting with these things and there's there's no CGI there. It's all practical. It's all practical. You're right. And, uh... Yeah, the original Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle movie. That's my top three favorite movies of all time. Oh, yeah. So, so I, I know exactly what you, what you mean. Yeah, that was a heavy film. Like it's heavy, dude. Yeah, it's like it's like there's like there's like some profound like like when Leo would like say something like wow that's like that's that's super deep and heavy. Yeah. Man. Wow. Yeah, and like uh, April's son is like you know he's he's on this like path to destruction because he wants to join the foot soldiers, but he's like doing drugs or, or you think he is. Yeah. And yeah, the foot the foot soldier. Uh, the layer, it's like the coolest place ever. It's like an arcade with like skateboarding. Is, but yeah. Kids can have cigarettes or whatever they want, you know? <laughs> like, I, I was watching that. And I'm like, man, this is kind of like, um, 
what is it, Pinocchio, when they go to the island and you get on the ride and you're like, the kids are, are checking this out. Like they're on the island smoking cigars, turning into donkeys and drinking and oh, stuff. Yeah. Like it was kind of like the 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 80s version of that, you know. But yeah. uh, it, it, looking back at that film, I'm like, man, this, there's a lot of heavy subject matter in here for a kid's film. Like There is. And, and, and when you hear like that was, what, what year was that, 84? I want to say it was it was even later. It might have been eighty nine, like eighty eight. Okay, yeah. Because I think Turtles right. two came out in the nineties, and that's yeah, when like right. Vanilla Ice was at the tail end of his. So heavy, dude. Yeah, yeah, dude. I I saw Vanilla Ice. We played a show in Ninja uh, Rap. Yes, <laughs> so dude. heavy, go dude. Ninja, go Ninja, go Ninja, go. Remember, didn't yeah, like, so heavy, dude. Didn't Ice <laughs> like he came out with like a like a heavier version of Ice, right? Ice I, I heard Baby. about it. Yeah. yeah. I, I remember, like, vaguely remember, like, he put, like, a, a new metal band together and, like, did that. But he, I would see him wow. at uh, at some of the corn stuff, like, backstage. And I really? was always just like, this guy's rad, dude. He's got, like, a cool story, you know. He seems he's, cool. Yeah, he's climbed some mountains, like, in the industry. It's just, it's so unique, you know. He had that beef with Arsenio Hall. Like, I was I was going on this, like, YouTube rabbit hole. <laughs> like, oh, man, part endless, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. There's just so so much interesting stuff that... I stopped paying attention to as I was growing up. But when I go back, I'm like, man, there was a, a lot going on, you know, when I was younger. But I was yeah. just seeing what was on MTV, like the music videos, you know. Yeah, he was awesome, dude. Yeah, yeah he's a beast. But I think he's, he rides dirt bikes and all that, yeah. was it Robert Van Winkle? Is that his name? I don't know. It's something, something like that. It's a cool name. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so uh, so you met him during some of the uh, corn shows? Yeah, we, we played... Uh, a festival in South America and he was on like it was like a crazy late slot and we had to fly out of there but I remember going wow. back to the green room and um you know each room has the artist's name on the outside of the door so that they know where to go and they show up and I just I remember seeing Vanilla Ice and I was Sick. like oh sweet dude Vanilla Ice is here and like the weather wasn't great I, I think maybe it was Peru or something I don't know. I'm not wow! Sure. But uh, I, I know I got electrocuted plugging something in on stage. Like electrocuted. Yeah. What like, would happen? Um, so there was like some uh, something wasn't grounded, and I, I had to plug in uh, something on the stage that wasn't plugged in as I was coming out. I was like, "Oh crap!" I think it was like the chaos pad or something like that. Yeah. And the second I touched the unit the house provided, I got hit like really hard. Like whatever it was, like shook me up. I, I got a lot of voltages. And uh, it was starting to rain a little bit. It was like half outdoors. And uh, I just remember we were starting the show and I was so shook. I was like, okay, I gotta, I gotta calm down and remember, you know, what sample to trigger here, when to start this so that I'm not holding everyone back. But yeah. after getting shocked that hard, it wasn't like just your usual, like, ouch, you know, it was like, dude, like that could have killed me if, you know, if I held on too long. Um, so that, that was pretty wild. But I think they always have issues over there with, uh, you know, the, the power, the electricity, the water, yeah. and things like that. So it was, <laughs> it was a gamble, man. But I'm sure, like, you've probably had some crazy road accidents and road stories, too. Like, you know. Yeah, th- just some weird shit happens. Yeah. Anything, you know? things can fall, like, from the, um, you know, from the roof. You got guys up there rigging things all the time. Like, you know, accidents are, are bound to happen no matter how safe you are. So South America was one where I was just like, okay this might be where I die on a tour because <laughs> there's so many elements. I just had LASIK eye surgery. I couldn't get any water in my eyes. Otherwise, I could get like a bacterial infection. Like, Whoa, no. Yeah, I was just like having a rough tour, man. I was like, this is my first time in South America, but I'm also kind of scared because <laughs> like a lot could go wrong. Man, that fucking sucks. Dude. It's funny how you, you got such a great opportunity and gig and then <laughs> stuff like that happens. We we were having a conversation uh, at Affliction. Shout out to Jose. Um, how this is like a fear you have in like the back of your mind when you're constantly flying. But you had like a near death experience with uh, flying with corn. Oh right, yeah, dude. So we were playing. Uh, I think it was Oklahoma, and we were, we took the slot. We took Ozzy's slot because he had broke his leg or hurt his leg. Mm. And so the only way that it could work out is if we flew private. So we basically had to fly in the day of the show and uh, then out that same night. So what we did was we were, we were on the jet, we were flying, which is a very small handful of us, um, 
Vino from Velvet Hammer Management was on the flight as well. And uh, it's taken a little bit longer than we expected. And so we asked the attendant, we're like, hey, like, you know, what's going on? Like, weren't we supposed to have landed? She goes, oh, we're just trying to fly and avoid some weather. And uh, you don't want to hear that, you know, so we're just thinking like, okay. Oh, no. But in my mind, I'm, I'm not thinking tornadoes because, you know, I'm just – I, I don't think that far ahead. Sometimes I don't put two and two together till it's like right in front of me. Yeah. And so um, the plane just starts kind of getting a little bit rocky, you know, and you look out and the wings are kind of going like this. And I know they're meant to kind of give a little bit, but it was not something I'd seen before on like a smaller jet. Um, and then we were all kind of joking about it, laughing. Our, our tour manager is super scared of turbulence in flights, so he's grabbing his seat. He's got his eyes closed. He's freaking out. You know, we're getting yeah. a little bit of turbulence. I'm taking some some video, um, and JD or Jonathan Davis, he's he's fearless. Like he doesn't care. You know, he's he's seen it all, done it all. So, um, <laughs> so all of a sudden, the plane starts going like this. And we're losing like these big chunks of altitude and just dropping. And I'd never felt like that before. Like your stomach drops with each one. And that's when it was like, okay, this is kind of serious. Like this is really intense. Um, I started praying, heads praying. Um, our tour manager's like crapping his pants. And, and John's quiet at this point. Like John, it, John's laughing before and making jokes, but he went quiet. And that's when I got worried. Because if John's worried, I'm worried. And uh, it was really, really rough. And it didn't give up or let up and uh eventually we did land and it was like oh of course i'm here now but it yeah. was just like okay what a relief then we get out of the plane our service is back on our phones and we've got um some black cars that are going to take us to the venue but it's a bit of a drive and we start getting amber alerts about flash floods and we're just like geez like okay no breaks so we we keep going we get to the venue uh we headline the festival it's awesome it's a great show and then the second we're off stage we can hear the tornado sirens and we had a, uh, a police escort arranged so that we can get right out because it's fairly crowded in the back area. And so we get in our cars and we start riding and basically to get to the, uh, the place where we're taking off from again, where the, the plane is parked, we have to drive on a road that's going straight towards this tornado. So we, we kind of haven't figured it out yet. We're just a little worried because we're getting the Amber alerts about the tornado seek shelter we hear the sirens. The rain is just going crazy. And uh, we're driving, and it's me, Monkey, and Head in the car with our tour manager up front and the driver. And he's on his phone going crazy, and we're just kind of, like, waiting for info. Like, what's going on? Like, what's, what's the deal? You know? And he starts telling the driver, he's like, go, 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 go faster. So we're just picking up speed. We're going, like, 100. Like, the sky's, like, green. The rain's, like, completely sideways. Just just very bizarre. And I'm just sitting there thinking, man, we're going to die. Like, because our only option is drive towards this airport um, where the, also there's a shelter down below. So we want to drive towards that. The tornado's coming uh, towards us. So we have to beat it to the shelter. Otherwise, we just have to stay where we are and, like, park under a, a bridge or something, you know. Um, so we just raced it. And we got right to the airport slash shelter and the pilots were waiting with the doors open and we grabbed our bags from the car, ran in, made it in to the safe area and turned on the news. And uh, the news is showing like a bunch of down power lines and cars and stuff. And uh, sure enough, the road that we were just on is what they're they're showing, you know, from like a safe distance. And uh, yeah, so we just hung out in there and, and just waited it out and uh once it was safe, we, we came up topside and we're, you know, just kind of walking around this airport. We were like the only people there, spare for a few. And uh, it, it just was like this eerie, bizarre kind of atmosphere outside, you know, because we're so close to this, uh, like this just crazy act of God. And uh, we're taking videos out on the runway and everything. And we waited a little while. We were able to get back in the plane and start taking off. And it was like nerve-wracking to take off again because the last thing you want to do is get back in the air after all that you know after that kind of plane yeah. ride dude yeah but i will tell you it was beautiful because the once we got to a certain point of safety you could see the clouds and the lightning like going across the clouds lighting them up and it was just the coolest thing to watch from these windows you know wow once we were above it and out of the area, it was smooth sailing. Like we just, you know, headed right back. But during all those moments, like it was just, it just felt like we were just like up against the clock. Like we were, we were done for, you know, like we were going to get caught in this thing. And I think like Fieldy and Ray uh, took their own travel and they, they weren't on the jet for whatever reason. And uh, both of them got stuck 
outside in like a van uh, and had to park in shelter like under one of those highway bridges while everything was going on. So I, wow. I yeah, I just remember texting them both like, are you guys OK? Like, you know, just wondering like what's going on. So, yeah, that was the closest, I think, to uh, a natural disaster that I've ever been in like being directly affected by it you lived and experienced that man yeah. like you you literally experienced like one of like my personal biggest fears like it's like yeah. okay is this a plane ride that's going to be like the one where like where i don't know like, like you're going past a storm or a tornado where like yeah. it's going down and you see like the like like the wings do what you're <laughs> that doesn't look like very natural you know yeah like you experienced it man yeah i never thought Fuck. i would i i used to get scared terrifying just for a little bit of a, you know, a big commercial airliner. I Same. Mean, that's nothing now. Like, if I got on there and felt a little bit, I'm just like, well, you know, like, we're fine. But that, wow. I think I experienced, like, the physical limits of one of those little jets, you know. And I'm glad they can take a lot because that we got a lot thrown at us. It was, it, I'm not, like, I may be even just downplaying how rough it was on there. Like, you know, I it, think you are. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it was being playing cool. It's it was awesome. pretty extreme. It was, it was alarming. So I, I pray that like a lot of people don't have to experience that, but yeah, it was, it was a wild one, man. And it's a cool memory for all of us to share. You know, we've had some, some things happen on, on those, uh, corn tours, you know, earthquakes in South America and whatnot. But yeah, this takes the cake, <laughs> man. Yeah. Is, is it a fucking dream job or a fucking uh, nightmare job? It's crazy how yeah. you had all like these these crazy experiences with, with such a cool gig. Yeah, absolutely. It's it's definitely the coolest gig to have those experiences with because those guys are like the best. You know, like yeah. you can, you can go out with bands and bigger artists and they they have egos and they have little like quirks. You know, where their team gatekeeps a lot of stuff. These yeah. guys are like the realest, like the coolest dudes, you know, but you, you have to earn the, um, you know, a place with them in friendship too, you know? So like, yeah. it's a, it's just like the, the best case scenario of a group of people you could travel with is those guys, you know, for sure. It's so cool. It's definitely no mystery why they are where they are. They seem so fucking cool, man. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and this is a question I really wanted to, to ask you, uh, I mean, a lot of producers or artists, uh, guitar player, drummers, you name it. Um, struggle, we hear are struggling to find a gig or, you know, or how do I get in the room? How do I get this gig? Or like, how, yeah. how, how did you accomplish that gig with Korn and then also previous gigs and also gigs you were also part of getting uh, after? Yeah. Um, you know, I think it's really important that you are real like you're genuine i know that sounds like cliche or cheesy but like people can tell when someone's real you know if somebody's there with an agenda like that stands out you know and, and growing up in los angeles there's no end to people that just want to get something from you and mm -hmm. like that's why they're talking to you but you know growing up i was just genuinely excited to be around creative people or musicians because like I felt like those were my people, you know, like all, mm -hmm. all of the friends that I had grown up with and the people that I was close with started getting into drugs and, you know, just changing and doing different things that I just wasn't interested in. You know, I had a different upbringing. I'm still really close with my family and uh, I still follow the same faith. And so I just, I, I didn't want to get involved in all that stuff, you know, and, um, I felt alone a lot of the time, like in my interests, weekend nights, you know, I'd be playing Chrono Trigger emulators on my PC and messing with delay pedals on my guitar. So my other friends were doing meth down the road, you know, and getting arrested. Mm -hmm. And uh, I just, I had no, uh, no desire, but uh, it was just crazy to know that there was a community because the town that I grew up in, even though it was so close to the entertainment industry and everything else, it still felt like a small town, you know, like finding out about uh, Poison the Well, uh, throw down straight Sick. edge like finding out about all that was like eye-opening to me you know and that that's all thanks to uh, uh jeremy balm uh who now sings for touche amore but he worked at the record store in burbank called backside records and uh every time i come in he'd have great recommendations for me he had like martyr ad cds oh, fuck. Uh, 18 visions bleeding through you know he would just hand me these great great albums and uh stuff i'd never would have been exposed to but through that you know I developed this desire to be involved in, in a scene like that, you know, and um, I made some friends uh, just from going out and networking and just because the reason I'm there is to meet people that are, you know, um, 
kindred spirits and and i think that translated people were like okay it's cool he, he just wants to hang out and make friends it's not like i'm not there to try to use anybody or get anything from him you know but it just happened to work out that i ended up getting uh into this cool path that took me into the music industry you know my first real touring band was with jen finch from l7 it was a band called the shocker and uh, I barely knew what I was doing. You know, I just knew how to play like tremolo riffs at the gates stuff. Like, and I yeah. had to play rock and soul in this band. And I was doing lead guitar, singing backup vocals. And then we were touring Europe, like immediately. It was like my first like real gig. And I was, I was so scared, but she just gave me a chance and, and never let that go, you know? Wow. And because she gave me that chance, I, uh, I always felt grateful. So anytime I was doing anything, it was just like I wanted to make sure that I remembered to be grateful. And uh, mm -hmm. and then, you know, I, I tried all kinds of projects. And at, at some point I signed to uh, Metal Blade Records and was uh, writing, I was writing an album for a band called Dawn of Ashes. And they were like an industrial, like horror thing. But the singer wanted to have his own like version of like black metal or, you know, some darker metal stuff. So he reached out to me and I ended up doing that gig and that kind of connected a lot of different dots that that translated to this day you know like we had Tim Smith managing us um and one of, one of my best friends is also managed by him and um so all of our worlds are connected you have like this ED, EDM world and you have like the this dark metal horror world you know so we just yeah. had all these fun and exciting opportunities but uh yeah so through that I ended up meeting people that I ended up uh, getting asked to play guitar for Winds of Plague. And uh, originally what, what was going to happen was John, Art, Elena, and Michael uh, Montoya and myself were just going to start a new project. And we were kind of doing like some like heavy, like Rob Zombie kind of stuff with like breakdowns, you know. And then uh, I think that turned into, why don't we just do Winds of Plague? You know, because John, uh, John just basically needed the guitars to keep it going and i guess that wasn't an option at the time with the other guys um but they had written such cool stuff you know they had such exciting music i was like dude this would be rad so i kind of just learned everything by ear with with michael and uh Sick. there was a lot a lot of gaps we had a feeling because we couldn't figure out certain things you know so we're just like well this kind of works so let's just do this too you know so we did some stuff with winds of plague um and during some of that time i i was asked to do uh all the sound design and voiceovers for the Avenged Sevenfold game. So they had a mobile game come out uh, called, I think it was called Death Bat. Um, yeah. And they asked me to do the sound design. I'd, I've been friends with the Avenged guys since I first moved to Orange County, you know, just through mutual friends. And um, we had to do a bunch for the game, but they also had a tour coming up. So they're like, why don't you just come on tour with us? And uh, Whoa. so, yeah, I jumped on the, the Mayhem tour and we were doing that. I was helping Johnny with some of his bass stuff as well just because it was like, you know, you can make some money too doing this and fill in some roles, and it was cool. And then uh, th because of that, I was out with Corn and Corn was on, on the Mayhem Festival as well. And uh, We're on that year as well. Yeah, yeah. So weird. Yeah, I mean, we were just all in this, like, same space, and we hadn't fully all, you know, embraced each other yet and developed these relationships. And um, But I was really excited to talk to uh, Brian and... Uh, fieldy about their faith because i have the same faith as well and I, that was something that they were like you know on fire about and it was like it was really nice to have um these ideals and things that i grew up with and be able to break away from like that tour environment for a little bit and just get together with them and we do kind of like a little bible study like uh kind of prayer thing and uh, you know if you're somebody that's like that believes in prayer or has been around that it's it's really like it's therapy, you know, it's uplifting. You kind of are venting and you're getting reassurances. And, um, yeah, so I, without preaching or anything like that, you know, but it was just cool that we were, we were able to get together and share that because it's something yeah. that you don't always, you know, have in the music industry. It's usually the opposite. <laughs> so um, we became really close and Head was just always uh, out doing family stuff with us. He was always invited out. He's just like my favorite person in the world, you know. It was really cool to have him around. And, um I, I was working on a show called The Voice and I was on there for about like six seasons and I was just trying to get some stability in my life because I'd been on the road so much doing shows uh, before wins. I was playing for Stolen Babies with like Gil Sharon and um, I just wanted to like know where I was going every day and like have a regular gig. I loved being on set. I loved the Universal Backlot. So I thought that that was the answer. Um, 
And then I got kind of burnt out a couple of years in and I was like, hey, head, like, do you mind if I just hit the road with you guys for a little while just, just to get my tour fix without, you know, really touring? So I did it. I jumped on the bus with him for a couple of weeks and uh, Fieldy comes up to me and he goes, hey, man, do you want to play keyboard for us? And I'm thinking like, keyboard, I'm a guitar player, but I, I use my keyboard in the studio when I'm writing. I use MIDI. I could do it. I said, yeah, yeah, I'd do it. He's like, okay. And I'm, I didn't think anything of it. You know, I thought it was just kind of like a passing thing. Um, and then you flash forward to the winter of that year and Head was out and he got the email where they're talking about the keyboard thing again. And he's like, do you want to do it? And I'm like, dude, sign me up. Like, I'll figure it out. So, so I'm in my garage making these little demo videos of me playing the stuff, you know, from what I can figure out from wow. listening to some of the isolated files and some of the live stuff. And I sent it over and uh they were like okay you can do the europe tour with us if it works out then you're the guy so i <laughs> got all ready to fuck? dude it was so nerve-wracking man because it was like two different elements to that it was like a like i had to design all the sounds from scratch um and design a program where i could skip through the sets without having any uh classical training and how to run tracks or set lists live or anything like that so i just did what i could figure out and just using you know different programs that i had um so once that was out of the way then it was like well i'm gonna be up on stage behind a keyboard i don't have the guitar to hide behind i can't do the guitar stage presence thing so what do I do there? You know, I'm just this fish out of water. I got these yeah. legends that have like 25 plus years with this stuff and they're fans that just want to see them. And I'm up there, you know, so I'm going to have a big old target on me if I screw up. So it was it was crazy, man. I, I just basically sat in my room every day and I pulled up all the live videos because the songs are, some of them are dramatically different live. Yeah. And I just practiced to those. So I'd practice for four hours a day uh, until it was like muscle memory. And my first real performance was them with them was on a direct TV show, like a live audience network show. So it was in front of a studio audience. <laughs> so I'm just sitting there. I'm like, man, I'm going to throw up. Like, I'm nervous. This is scary. But the second the first uh, note hit and the song started, it just it locked in. It just felt really good. It was like, oh, this is cool. This is fun. I practiced enough to where I could just do it with my eyes closed. As long as the computer doesn't fail and the keyboard doesn't fail, I'm I'm good, you know? So... Yeah, I, I got through it. Um, but yeah, I mean, those those opportunities all came to me basically just, uh, you know, not not seeking them in my relationships with these people. You know, it was just like I wanted to just genuinely have friends that, you know, were interested in the same things as me and, you know, that I respected as as musical peers. And um, and I was fortunate enough to just be, you know, given opportunities. And I said yes to everything. It's like, just say yes. Even if you maybe can't do it or you don't know if you can do it, say yes and just try it. Don't be afraid to fail. Because, uh, you know, if you're failing in front of some of the audiences that Korn's playing in front of, that's a lot of people to fail in front of. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I just think it's important to just, uh, you know, you, you have to believe in yourself to some degree, but you, you got to get past all that and go into, into work mode and show mode. You know, once the... Once that curtain drops, like you're not, uh, you don't have any time to be self-conscious. You really gotta, you know, just hold up and do it. You know, especially these guys. You know, they're counting on me to be able to hang with them. You know, and, and fortunately, I was. I think I messed up maybe twice in five years or four years or whatever. Wow. Like I, I just played the intro to the wrong song, and we just readjusted and played a different song. Oh, was, 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 was that kind of fuck up? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> like, I was like too far ahead on the set list because it was dark or something, you know. So th those were the only moments. Um, what, what they do? This fucking monkey just look back at you like what? The yeah, the, yeah. You'd always get like the fucking look. Like John, John is like, I mean, he is, he's. Uh, a beast when he's on stage he's aware of everything like he that's his world he owns it you know yeah. so he would look back but he was so cool he never yelled at me he never got upset he would just kind of smile like davy like you know and everybody <laughs> caught so up incredible. right there i mean we're, we're really not on tracks so yeah we can all just get into the next song on the fly you know that's and incredible. i think there was a, the one or the second time it happened i think the guys just assumed that's where we were at and then we just would, between tracks in the shadows, we would just come together and be like, hey, we got to go back and do this track. And then we would just immediately get back to it. Our guy wow. up front that was doing all the lights and, and video and stuff, he needed to know. And then we were good. So it was like, wow. you know, we just caught it on the fly. And it, Ray, Ray is insane. You know, he can just pick up anything that's going on. So there yeah. was it was cool to kind of, I was always kind of bouncing things 
uh, back and forth with Ray, you know, like, okay, the next song is going to start here. Maybe it starts with a sample or, um, we do like a, um, uh, encore song. So, you know, me and Ray got to time that cause he's got to come in and do his, do his vibe. And yeah. so, you know, it was a lot of like being able to communicate there, you know, and it's a, it's a miracle that, uh, I didn't <laughs> screw some other things up, but yeah, I just, I always knew like, it's, it's up to me so that they don't think about me or worry about me. Like if I'm going to be up here and I, you know, if I'm going to deserve to be up here with all the, the, the history they have and everything they've done, I've got to be a backbone, you know, I've got to be somebody that they can count on and I will be consistent and perform. And so, yeah, <laughs> it was, uh, it, it was always, uh, you know, kept me on my feet. It was super fun. It looks so Very fun, good. dude. Yeah, yeah, it really is. It really is. And, and like knowing you, Coming from, like we we come from similar uh, scenes like yeah. like like the Orange County hardcore scene, like bleeding through, throw down, wrench, yeah. Yeah. Eight, eighteen vision. So to have like to see someone come from the same scene, and I'm looking at my favorite band. I'm like, Davey's on the stage with them. <laughs> what the fuck? What world do we live in? Yeah, so cool, right. man. Yeah, it's, you earned it, man. <laughs> thank you, brother. Thank you. Yeah, I I love to see you know uh, other people that grew up but specifically with some of the things that you and I grew up with, because it's so special, you know, it's like yeah. th during that time, there was like a, there was a real scene in it. There was like camaraderie. There was, you know, there was history. Like yeah. there's so much cool stuff was going on. And uh, a lot of guys kind of fell through the cracks or didn't get appreciated during that time, you know? And like, um, I think that you're right. Yeah. That, that history is special. Like there's, it is, there's i'm sure new york has it i'm sure boston has it utah they've got they've got their bands you know and their shows but like we really had something like magic in orange county and in los angeles going on during those times like yeah. i mean how many times did you and i play shows and we didn't even know each other know that we would be here today you know like so strange um, it's crazy i i think it was a festival in uh boston at the palladium that scott lee was putting on and yeah. uh it was Alice Cooper, it was you guys, I think uh, it was Dawn of Ashes. And, uh, you know, we're, we're all in the same room. Our green rooms are stacked, you know, and we didn't even know, like, you know, cause so much yeah. was going on. Like, we could have been having a, a beer together, you know. Just, I know. And, and here we are. Like, it's just these paths are anything could happen. And it's so cool. You know, it's so exciting. It's and to, exciting. to be able to be a part of and give back to something that was really special to me. I, I listened to all the corn albums. I remember, uh, Keith from throwdown, uh, taking me to his car because he is, uh, had a really good car stereo. And that's like the final mix, you know, oh, test yeah, the car, the you car. Gotta, yeah, the car. Yeah. and he put test. on here to stay. And oh fuck, dude. I was, I always knew corn was heavy. I always appreciated him. But at that point I had kind of gotten really into some other genres and um when i heard here to stay in that first everything just kicks in right there dude i was like what like this is like like this this is putting the the handprints in the concrete on on, on hollywood boulevard you know like this is legendary yeah. heavy like uh so that whenever we would play that song live dude like it just brought me to life it was just like man like how, how does it feel on stage it's really, it's cool. Like it's, uh, it, I mean, it doesn't matter if it's like 200,000 people or like 200 people, you know, it's just like, I kind of always had this, uh, this kind of blinders on where I was like, I can't get distracted. <laughs> I have to make sure I'm doing everything perfect and on time. And yeah. the next thing that comes in is on time. Like this is all to support, uh, these founding members of corn doing their thing, you know? So mm -hmm. it was like, uh, it was like an exercise, you know, it was like, I would go up there and I would do this thing, but it was like a, it was like having a good workout when you got done, you know, just like, damn, yeah. like got through that one. That was awesome. Like yeah. it was a great show, you it's know? Like, Whoo. Yeah. Uh, yeah. An an another one down. Yeah. It's a, it's like, uh, you've heard like artists talk about like out of body experiences, you know, I don't want to be yeah. too dramatic, but you know, a lot of people would turn that into, Oh, they're possessed. You know, like Jimi Hendrix was possessed. It's like, no, like, you just you have to become something else in that moment to perform. You it's know, true. it's like being an athlete. Um, you know, you, you just you have to focus and <laughs> you've got to absorb yourself in everything that's going on and be on time. Like some I'm sure there's some artists where that's not their thing and you know, they function on chaos or whatever, just go on the fly, and that's totally fine too. That's those are all yeah. different things. But this was something that you have to be sober and precise, uh, <laughs> you know, to make happen. So yeah. so those live shows were uh you know, I'm sure I could have, I could have lived in the moment a little more, 
um, at times, but I feel like I always needed to just be in check and be ready and focused, you know? So yeah. that, that was kind of my experience so far, like on, on those, uh, on stage with those shows, you know, like I just was always hoping that everything functioned and, and went, you know, yeah. and, uh, I always had Jim, uh, Jim's the man he's, he's been with corn for Jim hotel. Shout out. Yeah. Great guy, man. Yeah. He's, he's the absolute best. Um, and he always had my back. And so I always knew, like, if Jim was nearby, like, I'm okay. Like, if something <laughs> breaks or yeah. goes weird that I don't understand, like, Jim's the guy, you know. And mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, I, I love Jim. Shout out, Jim. <laughs> yeah. Great yeah. guy, man. It's so, uh, it's kind of bizarre that we literally recently just connected, like, a couple weeks ago. Yeah. And I've seen you around for so many years. So we pass, we cross paths, and now, like, you know, we've done tours together, but not, like, together so we're like, like you were on tour corn apparently I, I did or a bench I, I didn't even know yeah it, and yeah. a week we, and uh we probably been to so many shows at maybe chain reaction or a showcase okay. together we, but no one so bizarre no one formally introduced us yeah it's one of those weird things where i know i know him yeah i've seen him for years but no one's like made that connection but then it was kind of like before us where like we jose uh jose mankin shout out we got we both got invited to that to that jam and then, uh, of course, uh, we probably both similar. So we were very punctual on time. Yes. So we're here at 9 o'clock. <laughs> we're fucking there at 9 o'clock. Yeah. No, we're not there at 9. We're there before 9. Yeah. Very, very punctual. So I, I roll up at, uh, at, at Affliction, and I, I see you. I was like, oh, shit. There he is. Okay, well, we, it's only us, so we, we, we got to start talking. Yeah. <laughs> it was, Dude. Uh, it was so cool to finally fucking actually officially meet and, like, and, and, we, and we talked for a while yeah. about about the whole Orange County uh, Inland Empire hardcore scene. Like it's very, you know, you know, when you talk about that stuff, it just lights you up. Yes, you know, because exactly. it's very because when you can go there with certain bands that you could talk about, it's it's really special. Yeah, that that honestly made my night, man. Like it was so cool connecting. Um, you know, I'm I'm really glad Jose did that because it really, you know, connecting people is important. And uh, yeah. You know, I have a lot of bad habits um, socially. Like, I get a lot of anxiety, and I, I mm -hmm. do the Irish goodbye. You know, I kind of slip oh, yeah, in. Slip, oh, yeah. Yeah. And it, same. I, I've had the, you know, the response where people thought maybe I was arrogant or I was uh, in a bad mood or something. But no, it's like I just have really bad social anxiety. So I don't always yeah. meet the people that I want to meet or uh, yeah. have those moments with them. You know, I like to have yeah. a, a genuine quiet moment to talk to somebody. If it's a little too crazy, I, yeah. I'm just like, well, I can't, you know, I can't do this. Like I'm, I don't have a loud voice. I'll lose my voice pretty quickly. Yeah, yeah. But uh, yeah, when we connected there, it was so cool. I'm like, man, why haven't we just always hung out? Like we have, we were talking about the coolest stuff, like just, you know, so many great memories, so much fun. And, uh, I was like, we would have been like best friends in high school, you know, like totally. <laughs> we probably would have been yeah. starting bands. So it was, it was just, it was a treat, man. That was definitely like the highlight of my night was, was hanging with you. So I'm, I'm stoked that you, you wanted to have me on the show. And I, you know, I really appreciate that. Yeah. Sam worked out. We're, uh, you know, I'm very similar to you where like you do like the Irish goodbye or like you kind of like have to kind of force yourself to go out and talk to people. Like you have to force yourself, but then once yeah. you do it, you're like, okay, I'm glad I'm glad I'm here, but, but yeah. you got to like tell your brain to shut up and just fucking do it yeah and um <laughs> exactly you i mean kind of getting into the habit of like you know davy's a great guy i know like we'll have a great time hanging out i'm going to hang out with him and then once you said oh i'll go to corona i'm like it's, it's, we'll just be on a podcast if yeah. you're, if you're already gonna yeah. be here fucking yeah man uh, I, and we and we we already have one there so this is pretty much part part two I'd like to think the candles were just for me too. So. Yeah, they are. They are, man. <laughs> I love me some candles. Like, yeah, and just, I can't. Uh, I can't get fake candles. Like, they, the candles got to be real. Yeah, they have to be real, man. Although I will say that they've upped the fake candle game. Really, like, I've got a couple of LED candles that are in wax, but the flame is like They're in wax. Realistic. Yeah, yeah. The oh actual, shit! I I, uh, I found that out because I had like two fake ones and a real one in front and it started yeah. melting one of the fake ones and i was like oh okay this is real wax so oh shit that's it, pretty cool yeah because the light goes through it a certain way i guess but um that was like one of my little uh tour items uh 
was always to have like a candle or something because you so you know how when you get you go to a new place they say like your brain goes into survival mode so yeah you don't sleep as well true so i always try to have like a familiar scent or something familiar i'd bring my bluetooth speaker and i'd have a playlist with familiar music Great. and then i'd have my candle with a familiar scent and that would that's smart yeah it, it was always like a good way to wind down because you know days off on tour like i i really just want to rest you know i might want to find like a really good restaurant or something mm -hmm. but you know you've traveled enough to where you're not trying to go see niagara falls every time you go there you know or whatever yeah. else you might do on on tour and so i i always had to make my hotel room like my sanctuary you know so yeah. that the candles it was huge for that it's something relaxing about it Dude, I'm gonna take that from you. That's a great idea. Take candles out on yeah. the road, and you probably worked on music too, right? When you're on, on yeah. the road, yeah, yeah. That's a little bit harder for me. I, uh, I'm really self conscious about mixes and stuff because that's that was probably the hardest thing for me was to learn uh, to mix. And a really good friend of mine, Arkady Zaslavsky, he. Uh, he would sit me down and he's like, look, he's like, here's the frequencies. You don't need all the frequencies here and all these parts. You got to start separating yeah. things and, and just taught me to listen differently. So yeah. working with anything but like good, like speakers, good headphones, I always was like, yeah. I'm just wasting my time because the mix is going to be terrible. But uh, I finally got to a place where I'm like, I can mix remotely and I can work on music. But it's great. Are you writing a lot when you're out on tour? Like I try. Yeah. But it's just, it's it's a hard discipline to stay on top of. Yeah, I absolutely. Yeah. So if you, if you if you found it or you're on top of it, that's a pretty I think special thing. So I'm trying to get tips from you and pick your brain on it. Yeah, I think <laughs> I think just getting like a, a setup that you can trust because you don't yeah. want to. You know, I mean, it's it's fine to make demos and then improve on them later. But if you really yeah. want to do something that's going to be a finished product, it's oh, nice to, to be able to trust it, you know. Yeah, finished it, product. Yeah, because, cool. dude, like, I mean, it's cool. Like, if you're writing for publishing or other people, you're going to be submitting a lot of demos. And then those are just get cleaned up later. So that that's wow. actually a perfect situation, you know. Wow. But uh, if you're trying to write stuff that you want your band to play on or have guitar stems that you're going to keep, like, yeah, you want, you want it to sound consistent, like the same as when you're home, you know. Yeah. So, yeah. Dude, what, what a cool, what a cool thing you had. Like, you must have been in such an inspiring environment. You're on tour with this sick band. And then you get to work on music. Yeah, such like a, a, an, an inspiring environment. But the part, the part adds to to what to what you do. Yeah, and you know what? Like I don't know. Maybe a lot of people don't talk about it. But when you're depending on the level that the band is that you're playing with, you know, you have certain advantages to that. And that's, uh, you know, time is sometimes one of those advantages. Like if you show up to a venue, um, how much work are you going to have to do? I mean, I've shown up to venues where I had to restring guitars in the cold and, you know, get ready. And then I've also played in larger bands where you have techs and, you know, so it's all different circumstantially. So if, if you have the gift of time uh, and you're touring and you want to do more than just tour, you, you absolutely want to fill that time, you know, with yeah. some writing and recording. Um, and I think that that's, that's really important. And we're always just waiting to wait, you know, like the big moment yeah. is when we're going to play that show. Yeah. So a lot of times you, you get there the night before and you're still asleep on the bus and you get to this venue and you can just sit there and drive yourself crazy. And I'm sure a lot of artists fall into substance abuse just purely out of boredom, you know. Totally. Uh, it, it's, it's a very scary and easy uh, hole to fall in. Yeah, yeah. And I, you know, I can't judge anyone that does because those, especially in some of those arenas, um, if you're stuck in a winter tour in the arenas, there's not a whole lot around you. It's just a very cold space and mm -hmm. you're cramped and, you know, um, it looks glamorous on stage when you get up there. Like, you know, people are excited to see these, these stars and these artists, but, uh, you know, a lot of times we're just sitting there for six, seven hours in a little dungeon <laughs> we call them in, underneath these arenas, you know, and, yeah. um, we're trying to figure out how to pass the time without going crazy. Yeah. Um, but uh, I tell you, if you, if you got to wait to pass the time, you want, someone like head around because he is the most entertaining human being alive like i mean i remember we were in japan we we're sitting in the green room um and head comes walking in a little late because he had to do something outside of the venue and he has a chain wallet on it catches on to the handle of a trash can grabs the trash can flips it over starts knocking over the mini fridge <laughs> and then <laughs> grabs a banana eats it takes duct tape and puts the banana peel and tapes it to the wall and then he's gone <laughs> it's, like, it's like stuff like that just i mean it's 
that I'll remember that more than anything, you know. So uh, I always enjoyed uh, those green rooms, just passing the time with those guys, man. Honestly, like Head is is the most entertaining, uh, spontaneous human alive. <laughs> Special guys, man. Yeah, and, and probably uh, probably helps you too that like most of of them are probably you know sober now and oh yeah, I probably mean a big help you know tr- yeah absolutely. I've I've been very fortunate to always have toured with uh, basically sober artists. You know, even when I did Dawn of Ashes, like everybody was very responsible in that sense. Like, mm-hmm. um, and at that time we were driving ourselves with van and trailer, fifteen pass. Um, you know, 16 foot trailer yeah. and it was dangerous. It was a winter tour. We're trying to keep up with Dimu Borgare and they've, oh, they've all, yeah, they're all on bus schedules and they're like, okay, you got to make the next venue, you know, so you can open. And, uh, Fuck. the, the weather outside is like below zero treacherous, yeah. you know, we're almost getting in accidents. So everybody's got to be on it. There's no time to, you know, so if we were, I think we bought some like four locos, like the original formula. Oh, the original ones. And that was the the craziest we ever got in the van. You know, we were drinking yeah. those, but we knew we had somebody that was going to drive. It was a four hour drive, so you know nothing was would be an issue. Um, but yeah, I mean it was rough. Like if if everybody wasn't on their game, you know, and there to do as much work as the next, um, yeah, it would have just been an absolute nightmare. You know, I don't think we could have yeah. got through it. Um, stolen babies. Everybody was sober. We, we had a great time. Great. You know, that was always like, it always, it always felt very like professional, you know, it felt like I was like, I was there to do a job, but then everybody respected each other's professionalism and the fact that we weren't making anyone else's life harder. So we were friends too, you know, we were, we all appreciated each other. And, uh, you know, the expectation with, with corn is like, if you're there, like you, you gotta be able to hang, you gotta do it and you gotta, uh, be somebody that everybody wants to be around, you know? So, uh, you know, same thing. Everybody just kind of held their own and, um, we got along so good. It was just like, it was like a brotherhood, you know? Yeah. Got a bunch of brothers that are just like, just happen to be really cool. <laughs> That's cool. Yeah. And, uh, and on Johnny and Plague, he's sober as fuck. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I've never really like talked to him about it, but I never saw him do anything of the sort. He's just a, a hardworking guy. And he's on it. Like, Mm -hmm. it seems like every time he has a chance, he's on his next move, you know? So he does the... Sick. um, He does a lot of the Halloween haunt stuff. Yeah, it looks awesome. Yeah, he's he's so cool, man, because he's so passionate about it. And he found a way to take this thing and just really go with it and just do all these cool projects. And, yeah, he's. I'm really impressed, like, with his work ethic, you know? And I I always kind of just tried to to give that same energy back to him, you know, like, cool. Like we're going to yeah. do this win stuff. I'm going to learn this stuff and, uh, you know, knock it out. And, and we're just going to go out there and do the work. And, th- and that's what we did, you know, like, um, a lot of the shows that we played, you know, it was the same situation. We were driving ourselves, you know, we weren't working with the driver. Yeah. Um, and it was just like, everybody needed to, to be a part of it and, and to be contributing, you know, to make it yeah. work. So, uh, again, another situation, just like really hardworking professional, uh, musicians, you know, just, just trying to get, get yeah. by and do these tours. Like that, I think that, you know, the same situation, uh, 15 to 20 years ago, it would have been different financially. You know, there's a lot more to earn in the live aspect and a lot more appreciation. Now it's like, I think you got to do a lot more and be a little more creative bands do the meet and greets and, you know, yeah. you got to figure out ways to, uh, survive and, and just put back. Um, I don't know if, if you've had this experience, but I feel like whenever I've made, you know, any money doing music, I've always wanted to put it back into the music, you know? Oh Yeah to improve it especially with like all the damn vampires like i'm always like all right i'm gonna get something new for my computer some new plugins yeah. and i you know i gotta figure it out all these plugins dude i've spent thousands on plugins you know just yeah mastering mixing synths uh synth software like it all adds up you know you don't you don't think like what goes into some of these tracks you know even just to have samples so um it's just that you just gotta have that desire to to nurture it and you know keep it going totally and uh, it's, you don't have to do it, but it's like, it, it's just endless stuff yeah. uh, to get what you need. It's endless. Yeah. Like it's just never enough and you always yeah. need something, you know? Yeah. It's ever evolving really. And it's always like, evolving as yeah. well. Yeah. Yeah. I, I always um, really admired my friends that were like aware of the new technologies, the n- new coolest way to do something, you know? Yeah. Like one of those guys was Keith Barney. He was always like, um, 
he was always on top of like Apple products and, you know, ways to record and things like that. He's like, oh, dude, he's like, you're still, you know, programming drums with this thing. He's like, now I'm using this and, and all you huh. have to do is do a few things and it does the fills for you and then you can change them later. I'm just like, well, like, uh, you always just got to stay on the move, you know, and keep yeah. up. Like uh, when Splice came out, like that was awesome, dude. It's like, wow, thousands of samples and things that are um, – royalty free and you can just use these to piece things together you know yeah. it's like the options are limitless i always was uh i always felt like some of the older producers or studio guys were kind of gatekeeping us with like the uh digital things you know they want to do it analog and they talk trash on like amp modeling and mm -hmm. things like that but now it's like you can't tell the difference like it's it's cool you can have like you know 20 different amps and cabs in a little computer chip and it all sounds like pretty convincing yeah you know? yeah it's all I th I think it's all sick. Like like the new yeah. shit's awesome, um, uh, the old shit's awesome. You yeah. know, I just I, th I think it uh it all it all serves each other. Yeah. You know. Totally. You can um you can score a film on a laptop. You know, a big blockbuster film now. There's no reason not to. You know, and it's uh, yeah. I think people would be foolish not to utilize um, you know those those things that are available to them now like it's just mm -hmm. it's such a cool time to to be creative because it is man yeah yeah there's just there, there's so many options and uh so much utility for us to just like take advantage of like me and you could like sit in here for 24 hours and we could probably record a polished ep that sounds mixed and mastered and just do everything together you know yeah and, and put it absolutely out the next day yeah it's it's so cool man what a time um i really just like I, I don't think there's a space for gatekeeping because like there's it's, not yeah no, you know, you're right and uh, I th I think one of the most special things and coolest is like the professional looking and sounding stuff is becoming more affordable yeah and, that, and that that's been huge for all, you know all all of us yeah you know it's so huge you know we could get like professional cameras we could get like professional plugins yeah and it's like we we anyone could get this stuff yeah. and use it that's fucking badass yeah. man. Yeah, it's, it's huge. It's so cool because you get these these younger, just really smart and driven people that see these big corporations charging for these things and they figure out how they did it and they're like, oh, well, you didn't have to charge that much, you know. So you break through the greed and the um, the hierarchy and you can just like grab these cool things. Like I remember when um, I first saw Superior Drummer, I was like, oh my yeah. gosh, like I'll never have to worry about a drummer flaking on me again <laughs> not being able to explain. We all, we all secretly had that. <laughs> yeah. That I thought. mean, dude, how crazy <laughs> are drummers now? Like, do you remember like in high school, like to find a good drummer? It was hard as fuck, dude. It was, dude. So hard. It was, yeah. the, it was uh, the hardest. Yeah. Yeah. And now you got like, like Infinite Annihilator and you got like, like kids yeah. that are just... Like I watch these YouTube videos, it'll be like a seven-year-old kid, and he's like playing like, uh, I don't know, like what, what's it's fucking blasting already? <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's crazy. Just <laughs> gravity blast. Like I'm like Dude. origin cover. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> where, where were you when I was in, in high school? You I know, know, like man, so tough. could have been unstoppable. But yeah. you know, the standard is just like up there. Like, and it's there's just an endless uh, stream of content now. Like, you, yeah. and you could find stuff that's just as good if not better than like some of the the more cherished songs throughout history that are just being created right now like in a garage on a computer <laughs> yeah know? it's nuts yeah it's it's so cool like and you could see that as like a threat or a way that just kind of waters down things but it, it actually just it's exciting to me I, you know i think like it is it's inspiring like it makes me want to up my game like you know when i'm making the synthwave stuff like i don't want to just copy paste and you know, grab a couple of VSTs. I'm like, okay, like, how do I make this interesting? How do I really dive into this mix, you know, and put some passion behind it? And yeah. Putting great vocals on it is, you know, one thing. Like in the synthwave community, um, there's a lot of flack for vocal synthwave. Like they want like their instrumentals and stuff like that, you know? Huh. But it's like, I'm not really like, not trying to service that and just make synth wave like i'm just trying to make cool songs you know that yeah and they just happen to have some like retro synthesizers on there but you know i'm going coming at it from like an edm approach with the samples and the side chaining and you know it's 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 funny because everybody's so quick to um kind of make sure they understand what genre something is or where it yeah. belongs because if they, if they don't know if they can't identify it with something they're they're remiss like you know or they just they can't get behind it so uh you almost have to play the game to some degree you know but there's just so much great stuff out there man i yeah. i was i was writing uh 
you know, metal albums and listening to Sade and like 80s Madonna, you know? Perfect. <laughs> yeah. That's like, the way to do it, man. Yeah. yeah. I love that. You don't want to listen to metal and then play metal. Yeah. You know, I mean, you got to get inspiration from, uh, it makes you think differently and play differently. Totally. Yeah. It's cool. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's no secret that like you'll put out what you put in co consistently, you know? Mm -hmm. um, obviously, it's great to be inspired by, especially when you're making metal, you, you want to look at some of these guys that are just like conquering certain areas or doing cool things and you want to be yeah. inspired by that. But like, if you're just borrowing from something in the same field, you know, yeah. then you're just going to keep emulating the same thing over and over again. But it, I, I love to take influences from somewhere else. I actually, I think like it was, it was a Sade song and I ended up taking like a melody from a part and turning it into like a tremolo riff and like applying dude. it to a solo. <laughs> yeah. Sick. Dude, I, I've, I've done that where like sometimes you'll write like a acoustic riff on like a six string acoustic. Yeah. But then like, you know, I'll transfer it to like the seven string. Then I'll like, or start chugging like the chord progression I was doing. Then yeah. I'll start tremolo picking the progression. Oh shit. It's like, a, <laughs> yeah. okay. And yeah. then, and then you'll fucking make it from E to A. I said, like, mm -hmm. oh, it's just, I, it, 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 it could just go anywhere it's just endless it's truly yeah. infinite yeah it, it's it's good to like uh not over inundate yourself with options because then you'll never get anything done right but like what that, it, that you're right that is ultimate balance yeah. you're right consumer fatigue is that the the term they use for it? like netflix like there's too many options and you just spend all consumer, the time or i heard i heard uh, that i heard uh, option fatigue as well yeah so yeah. you know it's important to like take that away from yourself like i have to do that with uh synthesizers and stuff like that because mm -hmm. I, there's thousands of samples and good synths, but I just have to say, okay, I'm only going to use these three today, and then I'll Sick. get something done, you know, That's, give myself okay. those limits. Yeah, uh, they say that uh, creativity comes from, the, uh, comes from the limits that you put on, on yourself because then it makes you think and play differently. Yeah, yeah, so it, that's a case where I think that, like, limitations are, are great, cool. but limiting your... Uh, your appreciation for things and your tastes, I think, is is detrimental. Dude, you know? like, there that's a, that that that's what you call a lose lose right there, man. Yeah, man. Yeah. There's so much great music out there. So many great genres to to take from, be inspired from, to make your, yeah. let's say, your close minded metal. You know, who yeah. cares? I mean, you take you could take for so many things and write a fucking sick death metal song, dude. Yeah, absolutely. There's there's so much to pull from, and a lot of it's you know cinematic, even hip hop. Hip hop has some like really cool stuff and cool yeah, ideas. Yeah. Like Dr. Dre, he used to always throw in those really high like whistles and those like notes that he would drag yeah. over everything. I love that. So I'm like, all right, I want to do like a a song that's really heavy, but in the background there's like that kind of eerie like you know like high note that's just traveling with it, you know, and like that's all from like dr dre yeah. yeah i even do that in like my all the damn vampire stuff like i always have like a like a higher kind of feedback chord that's playing and i bend it you know and that's dope yeah those are those are all like from the 90s hip-hop like dre day like all that stuff you know yeah it's funny I, I was you know i was listening to all the damn vampires and i was getting inspired to play metal yeah like, you know, like, this is what it's all about man yeah. oh like i'm getting like because I, I was playing like everything i was like doing like some photoshop things just just listen to music and it's going. You know, when you're in that like cool trance, you're yeah. just working and listening to music, the best. Yeah. And then I was like, after I was on crying, I was uh, listening to, <laughs> I was <laughs> thinking of like this riffs. Yeah. It, it is of when you're, like, you're inspired, you just start thinking about like, like, oh wow, this is this is dope, dude. Totally. I love I, I love being inspired, man. It's, yeah. It's badass. Yeah, because I mean, it's it, especially when there's a lot going on. It's rare that to you to really get truly inspired, you know, during those moments. So like, we got to yeah. break away when that happens. Like the second you feel that you got to go and like lay it down. Like you got to put something together. You got to do that second. And it's a, it's a fucking bad habit when you don't do it. Yeah. Cause it's, uh, you, you ever had the, uh, the feeling where like your brain tells you, Oh, you don't got to put that down. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Every time that happens, mm -hmm. tell your brain to shut the fuck up and just do it. Yeah. It's, yeah. A, it's a bad habit. Just do yeah. it. Even if you got to use like your phone voice memos to like the voice you know, memos, dude. Dude, how, how many it. do you have in that thing? Probably thousands, right? You can just fucking scroll yeah. and scroll and scroll, dude. Same. It's crazy. Like I can go back and I'm like, what? I don't even remember putting this down. It would be like some weird like piano sound or you know yeah. just like some riff on an acoustic. Like I used to love writing uh, electric or heavier stuff on acoustic first. Because yeah, something cool. about that, like once you have practiced on acoustic, then you play on electric, it's like totally you can just achieve a different level of clarity on it, you know? You're right. Like 
those fault, like pinch harmonics and stuff. Like I would always just like mess with it on acoustic, even though it wasn't going to go anywhere. And then yeah. I get on my electric and I'm like, Oh dude, I could, I could catch it with like the palm of my hand when yeah. I come off of it, you know, like it's just cool little, little things that like, it's like, uh, training with, uh, those oxygen masks on that are that emulate high altitude. Oh yeah. Yeah. You know, and then you get, you get that off and you're like, Oh dude, I could run like totally. five miles right now. Yeah. Oh yeah, you ever find that like sometimes you'll write something that you, you don't you don't think is very good at all, but then that's the thing that stays in your head. Yes, for forever, always. like like a year after. Always, it's just like why is that thing I think sucks? Yeah, just stays in your head, dude. I always, and you know this this is a little like in, in, inside like industry conversation is like merch designs. A lot of times, like you know, you'll see like t-shirt designs to bring on tour for merch and like the design that the band's like oh like i don't i'm not feeling that one that one will sell the most and you're like okay like why did i doubt it you know like totally like, yeah it's just it's so weird like we'll convince ourselves of something that's not good and then come back to it later with fresh ears or fresh eyes and just yeah. be like oh that's that's great i'm glad i stuck with that you know? totally yeah. yeah yeah same goes when like you're kind of just just from pure focus and discipline is trying to work out a song or a riff or like you're just trying to get it down like all day you're like oh, i sound like shit i, yeah. I, I, I get, get, get get out of the room then yeah. when you come back in an hour and in the next day you listen to it oh this is fine what yeah the fuck? you said it dude get out of the room like that's it's always good to just take a break from things you know you can totally. translate to anything you want like totally. you, you can give that to like a relationship like you're gonna drive each other crazy if you see each other every day but you take a couple days apart and it's like oh I miss her. You know, I want to get back. So, yeah. like, you got to refresh yourself. Um, Me too. Yeah, I'll sit there and drive myself crazy trying to mix a song, and I'm like, okay, this is where I need to stop and just walk away. Two days later, I come back, and I can just completely sort out whatever it was that yeah. I wasn't hitting. It's so weird, you know. It's we just, weird. I think the word is desensitized. Like, we just become desensitized. And, mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's, it's just everything in moderation and you just give yourself that space and you can apply that to anything you want. You know, you don't want to work out your, your shoulders every day or your knees every day, like yeah. at the gym, cause you'll hurt yourself. So you gotta, you gotta spread it out and everything, you know, in it's time and place. Yeah. Um, and that, that's such a, a profound like principle with music and songwriting, you know? Yeah. Get out of the room. Yeah. Get out of the room. You heard it. <laughs> yeah, and then you get get to get force yourself sometimes too, like because sometimes yeah. like when you're in that flow state, yeah, you don't want to stop. Yeah, or you, you, you can't stop. It's mm -hmm. weird. Like I, I got, I gotta get, get this done. Yeah, yeah. There's never you never finish a song. You always just walk away from it. It's like that's true. This is the time I chose to walk away because I, I could sit there and tinker with stuff for forever. You know. Yeah, it's endless. Huh? Yeah, if I'm programming drums, like if I really sat there and did it, like. It, it would just be ridiculous. Like, be like, what is going on? Why is the snare hitting that many times? And why yeah. is there there a ride on this song? It's like, totally. oh, so I sat too long with it. But you know, just strip it away, walk away, to give it give it some air to breathe, and come back and just say, I'm done. <laughs> like, let's finalize this. You know? Yeah, totally. This is a question I've been asking um, most of my guests. Where where do you see the music industry going? Oh, that's a good that's a good question. Um, you know, honestly, I think that the theme that I've been seeing is that it's been opening up, like, as far as access goes, you know. So there's going to be more opportunities for people to do things of their own accord without a label, without, you know, some of these checks and balances. Um, things like Coachella, like, you might see a, a festival that's put together on the fly, but, you know, sees the same crowds as Coachella, and, and it's all unsigned artists, you know, like... I think that there's going to be developments in like blockchain technology, NFT technology. You're going to see uh, bands releasing more of their albums as NFTs and songs and things like that. So it, it's going to become, I think, really wild for a minute. It's going to kind of go all over the place and there's going to be all kinds of ideas that might be absurd. And then that'll come together again and there'll be a structure. We saw the same thing with streaming, you know, coming out of CDs and, and then you yeah. had like your Napsters and LimeWire and all that. And then they stopped fighting it and they're like, how do we embrace the idea of LimeWire and Napster and yeah. actually turn this into a functioning business? So mm -hmm. you're, you're going to see the same old blood trying to stay in the game, you know, know. and that's fine. That's just the way it is. But um, I, I think it's going to be interesting to see because it'll be like the Wild West for a little bit, especially because of the blockchain technologies and cryptocurrencies and things like that. That's all very important. We're going to have that uh, utilized in our day-to-day -day life in a way that we 
probably wouldn't have imagined, you know? So, um, I wouldn't say spend thousands on Dogecoin, yeah. but you know, like just be prepared to embrace that. And, and that is also going to have a, a heavy place in music. I've talked to some guys that are doing things with the NFT, uh, structures and, you know, doing some, some really cool things that like seem like sci-fi, but, um, that's going to translate on a global level. Yeah. And, and NFTs are cool. It's yeah. a way to make, um, the, these these things more tangible and give you some ownership over a song that you might not have been able to have any sort of ownership. You might even see people collecting uh, fractions of a point on a song sales, you know, because they purchased an NFT or wow. something in the in the blockchain. But uh, yeah, I I can see this. Uh, I would say to sum it up, the music industry, I could see it going just completely wild and open and it's just new territory with new technologies, and then uh, you know give it five six years maybe maybe more and it'll all come together and there'll be a system there that'll be pretty interesting something different for sure wow you're right i get how long did it take for the streaming thing to take part from napster to like spotify that took a decade yeah, before, yeah. you're right yeah there was a lot of push you know because a lot of people are in place and they're making their money and they have their system and it's worked for them but yeah you know they don't want to see the change you know you don't the fuel industry doesn't want to see the tesla you know but uh True. it has to happen like it's just inevitable you know and it's all the artists that are young and embracing it and, and taking advantage of that they're gonna you know be the next wave of the, the yeah. guys that are having success you know but it's like what defines success um is always going to be different like originally it was your album sales and uh you know you'd have your your golds and your platinums and your physical records and stuff and now like that's a it's a whole different definition like i mean having a million streams on spotify isn't exactly the biggest uh triumph anymore you know like that doesn't translate to as many albums bought or sold as it used to and yeah it's it's really interesting like i i think that it's all about just being open to innovations and embracing them and being a part of that because the people that are fighting that are going to get left behind and they're going to be really unhappy <laughs> absolutely yeah you're right so does that mean we got to start a TikTok? yeah i think uh, so man right. honestly it's it's alarming like how songs are breaking just from TikTok alone so i think That's we're insane. gonna yeah we're gonna have that for a little while too and then there'll be a whole other thing TikTok might become its own streaming platform or record label you know wow it, I, it, I heard that uh I could be wrong. I heard Spotify is trying to get into like the like the comment realm. So there's comments on the songs. Is it? Yeah, I'm, I, I heard. I, I heard. I, I think I heard like Joe Rogan whisper that a few times. Where like they're trying to like make it like a whole like interactive, like, yeah, interactive thing. I'm like, dude, I, yeah. I, I, I'm on Spotify all the time. I'm down, Fuck dude. It. I'm I'm so curious how that'll turn out because it's like, uh, you know, traditionally like when people are allowed to say things from hiding you know from a computer like it can be pretty toxic so there's going to be a lot of new issues that come with that too you know you right. have your spam people are going to be spamming like oh you like this check out blah 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 and they'll hire bots or develop bots to you know so that's going to be really interesting like if, if they go that route i think they're definitely going to need to do a verification system so they have real people interacting you good know, idea with consequences yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. For for every good, there is going to be a, a bad somewhere. Yeah, once they, unfortunately, you don't want to get the lamb goat community commenting. Oh on Jesus, there. you get some real winners there. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> seen it all on there, man. Oh fuck. <laughs> well, David, thank you for uh, making a drive, man. Thank I, you. I appreciate it, dude. Anything you, you want you want to share? Yeah, uh, you know, I, I really appreciate if you guys would uh, keep your eyes out and keep your ears to the ground for all the damn vampires, some of the new releases I have coming out, some of the collaborations with Sumerian Records, and uh, some of the singles. So thanks for having me, brother. Anytime, man. I'm, I'm glad we've, after so many years of walking by each other, we've finally connected. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm really stoked that we're now officially friends, man. Same. I love we got to do it more. I know. I'm going to hang out a lot more. Yeah, absolutely. All right, everyone. That's it. Later.